Welcome. I'm Mary Bassett, director of the Francois Xavier Bagneau, or FXB, Center for Health and Human Rights at Harvard University, based here at Harvard Chan. I'm also a former health commissioner, having served in that role both in New York City and New York State, and I'm very happy to be here today with our panelists. Seated next to me is Akila Johnson, who is a national reporter focusing on health disparities for the Washington Post. And next is Amber Payne, the publisher and general manager of The Emancipator. Thank you to both our online and in-studio audiences. Let me start here. We've seen study after study measuring racial ethnic disparities in health, but for too long, academic and medical communities in the media and in the academy and in the public imagination have seen these disparities as a product of biology or perhaps culture and not related to racism. So I'd like to start out by talking about why it's so important to cover health disparities and how to do that in a way that debunks the myth that these disparities are somehow the result of innate differences. So Akila, let me turn first to you. So I like to say that I cover the way racism and social inequality affects health, as opposed to saying that I cover health disparities. And I think that that's a different framing and a different way to kind of engage in the conversation. It gets directly to your point because, I mean, when we think about COVID, right, when we think about this kind of global pandemic that we just went through in the United mm -hmm. States and we saw how communities of color were disproportionately impacted, you know, there were studies that showed um, particularly folks in white communities who thought that these were the these differences were the results of biology were less willing to adhere to mitigation strategies right mm -hmm. this is somebody else's problem this is not our problem mm -hmm. but then we began to see shifting changes in the patterns of death because it's everybody's problem mm -hmm. you know we just did a big life expectancy um, report at the Washington Post and initially when you talk about the differences in life expectancy, people automatically go to, well, that's because people of color have lower life expectancies and that's dragging down the U.S. overall. And no, everybody's life expectancy in this country is harmed. And that has to do with the way we have shaped society. And so a lot of these health disparities are not necessarily the results of biology and all of my re reporting and as I talk to academics, nobody's ever reported to the race gene as the results of these, of these health disparities. <laughs> they point to social and structural inequality in the way we have structured society. Mm. I'd really like to commend you on that series on life expectancy. If, if the audience here and online hasn't read it, I, I'd like you to do it. And it's full of facts and, and figures. Uh, but I've also learned over time about the importance of storytelling, mm -hmm. uh, something that you draw on, Akila, and I also, uh, Amber, I've had conversations with you that really highlight the importance of storytelling. So I'd like to ask you how you think new assignments on stories are made, uh, what you think should go into making those assignments, and this time I'm going to start with you, Amber. Sure. Um, well, this plays off of what Akil was talking about when you're thinking about assignments and thinking broader than just that, that single story and thinking about the intersectionality of a story. You can't tell a story about um, climate justice without thinking about health. You can't tell a story about the financial wealth gap without talking about the health. Um, housing, um, we're talking about redlining, we're talking about communities and uh, people being sequestered into communities or kicked out of communities. You can't tell that story without talking about health. So I think one thing is that we've seen a lot more in the last three years since the, you know, there was the, the so-called newsroom reckoning mm -hmm. um, where many editors and journalists, um, there were some of us who we've been trying to tell these stories for mm -hmm. a while and tell them in a nuanced way. Mm -hmm. um, and it's hard to sometimes break through with an editor and break through to say, no, this is, this is really a story. This, this is, there's something here. Um, I think after 2020, with the reporting on COVID disparities, um, there was more of an interest in giving some people a chance to, to tell those stories. And um, the power of recognizing the power of, uh, of, of a different medium. I mean, I think I have a video and documentary background as well. You know, there's power in that form of storytelling. I think there are a lot more um, podcasts, there's a lot more mediums where people can 
um, tell these stories about health disparities in different ways to reach different audiences. Um, you, you, there's probably, many of you are probably on TikTok and you have your health, <laughs> your health talk that you follow. So I think, um, I'm, ho I'm hoping that there are, are, are more nuanced ways to, um, to, to tell these stories and um, kind of meet audiences where they are in a way that is intersectional. Well, let's just stay with you for a moment and talk a little bit about The Emancipator. Um, and if you could just talk about what your vision is for your newsroom and, and what makes it different than other news sure. sources at the moment. Yeah, sure. I mean, so we say at The Emancipator, you know, we are uh, exploring and explaining solutions to racial inequality. And um, really, we were an answer to that newsroom reckoning where uh, this was a collaboration initially between the Boston Globe and um, the Boston University's Center for Anti-Racist Research, this idea of, of bringing together um, opinion and perspective and analysis and commentary just to call back to those uh, 19th century abolitionist publications that were calling for you know, the immediate end of slavery. It was radical at the time. So when we talk about um, doing journalism that is, is calling for um, how do we end racial inequality, <laughs> it's, mm -hmm. it's maybe laughable to some. Um, but that's really the idea, to have that radical imagination behind the solutions. And these solutions could be coming from experts here in the Harvard Chan School, or you know, we had a solution circle with black and brown breastfeeding mothers and doulas and birth sisters. And you know, they were sitting there telling us in this you know, community gathering we had in Roxbury about their challenges mm -hmm. and the solutions that they needed. Um, and that's not something that you're getting on the, you know, the front page of, 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 of a mainstream newspaper. Mm -hmm. So you know, that's really our, um, our vision is to um, be able to elevate these solutions, not just talk about the problems, and, um, because hopefully those are replicable in other, other communities. It seems like both of you uh, make it a really important part of your reporting to elevate voices from whom we don't always hear. In fact, whom we rarely hear from. Um, so uh, if you could just talk about that, and, and this is really for both of you, um, wh why it's so important that we both find and elevate these voices. I mean, it's been a core mission of mine even prior to covering um, my current beat. So this is the first time that kind of officially in my title mm -hmm. there has something to do with race. I've, I've mm -hmm. covered criminal justice, I've covered education, I've covered immigration, I've covered politics, but the through line through all of that is always very much including the voices of marginalized communities because I think it's 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 easy to kind mm -hmm. of follow the pack, right? To go where everybody else is going. Mm -hmm. But if the point is to get to the truth of the matter, mm -hmm. the truth quite often lies kind of like I say on the ground floor, you know, so the the people who are closest to the harm, the people whose stories are not being told, if you're trying to, to tell stories from all dimensions, it is incumbent upon us mm. to bring those stories more into the mainstream. And it's not always an easy prospect to do. There's a lot of mistrust for very good reasons um, that you have to get over, you have to you know bridge gaps. But I think it's incumbent upon us as storytellers and as journalists to go to those places because if our job is to be advocates for the truth, how can we not? Mm -hmm. It also, it seems to me, elevates the wisdom that we can find outside of the usual talking heads, outside of the academy. Mm -hmm. If you could also speak a little bit to what it takes to find these voices, Amber. Um, well, it just takes, I mean, it, 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 takes, it takes looking, it takes giving a chance. I mean, I think, I think about um, journalists that I've worked with who were maybe green in their writing and they, they couldn't get a pitch through and they would tell me, you know, no one will accept this story. And I would accept the story and it had, you know, something to do about the intersection of race and, you know, fill in the blank topic. Mm -hmm. And it was those moments of, you know, working with those writers and getting their voices out. But then we're talking about people, people in the community, the pe who are the people in your neighborhood that you meet and that kind of sit with you and that you might go back to and you might, um, instead of making it transactional as a journalist, you know, hey, we don't have a lot of time, but finding those times to, to check in with people and to give a call over to a community center and say, what are you all working on? What's happening? I'm not calling you on deadline. I'm just calling to see, what are you guys talking about today? Mm. And that's, um, 
important too. You know, we we have a, a series essay series this week. You know, uh, banned books week is kind of the beginning of October, and it's it's banned books month. You know, we have a series from incarcerated writers, and they there's a woman who is in solitary who wrote this essay for us today. It wasn't easy to get to her. We worked with um, the folks at Pan America, which was amazing. Um, and we've been trading messages back in a secure message system to, to get edits and get approvals. And wow. it's more complicated and it takes longer, wow. but it's worth it. Um, so those are the things that kind of figuring out systems to break or bend around to, to get to people like that who don't have those, those portals and channels um, to, to elevate their voices. It, it, it takes digging and I think it, for me it's taken having some of those community partners or grassroots partners who are, they trust, they, I can build trust with them and they're willing to kind of um, bring someone into the fold, you know, to have, a, have that meeting of the minds. Mm. No, as, as I'm listening to you talk, I'm, I'm thinking about too the importance of um, source building and trust building, right? And so as you're talking about not being so transactional, right? Not just extracting information from communities. Um, so one of my favorite kind of reporting techniques, I'm getting ready to give away some trade secrets here, <laughs> is, uh, you know, you quite often go, you hear people talk about how you go to a coffee shop and just listen. I like to go to various coffee shops in different communities and just sit and listen and engage to, and hear different perspectives. And part of that, there's usually this moment where you also have to listen to a lot of criticism for what the media has gotten wrong and what we don't get right and how we're mischaracterizing folks. And that's fine and that is important because we don't always get it right. Mm -hmm. But that's how you build trust and that is how you have conversation across difference and bring nuance, new perspectives into the community. And it's not just going to marginalized communities when the issue is on insert black issue, insert mm -hmm. Latinx mm -hmm. ins ins issue, insert like LGBTQIA issue, right? It's going to a community and saying, talk to me about government shutdown, talk to me about mm -hmm. inflation, talk to me about the things that are in the news and how they're affecting your community. And you will be surprised by the things that folks have to tell you. And they think about more things than you think they're thinking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that's interesting. I, I mean, when you're both talking, I'm reminded of a series that was done on diabetes, which, as everybody knows, has become a, a, a condition of escalating public health importance. And it was collected all the facts and figures. But what I remember from a series was a, one, a woman being interviewed who said to the reporter, you know, I'm worried about my job. I'm worried about paying the rent. I'm worried about my child, and I'm not going to worry about that donut. Mm -hmm. And it just, for me, it mm -hmm. really captured uh, an essential truth that perhaps wasn't coming through with just the numbers. Mm -hmm. So you both work with numbers and stories. Mm -hmm. um, you have, uh, you're at a, you know, renowned uh, national paper of record. And you're working with a new model, um, a, a nonprofit newsroom. And do you just want to talk a little bit about that and the role you're in both yeah. important voices in the field? Do um, yeah. you want to just talk a little bit about how you're seeing the nonprofit newsroom? Oh, yeah. I think, I mean, in recent years, the nonprofit newsrooms, I, there have been a number of incredible startups, and we all are you know, have a little bit of unity together as well. I mean, it's it's challenging because a lot of it is um, based on a philanthropic fundraising model as mm -hmm. kind of propping things up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have seen, um, we've seen giving change <laughs> from 2020 to 2023 mm -hmm. and uh, the, the floodgates of, of, of giving that, that, that was promised then. So that slowed down. But I think as a nonprofit newsroom, we also have, you know, we're, we're inventing things as we go. Um, we can... We can do partnerships. I mean, I think that is um, something that we've been able to do uh, and cross-pollinate with another newsroom because for, for me, it's about, not, uh, it's about getting that piece out. If that means um, the Globe also runs the same piece and they get three times as many views, then great. We, we're, we're, we're getting a larger audience. If that means um, that it's in uh, the, the magazine of uh, the Harvard Health magazine, um, then, then that's great. We have another audience that we're reaching. So um, I think that's a good opportunity for the nonprofit newsrooms. It's more, 
it's not, um, I'd say, I mean, of course, we're all competitive. We're journalists. We want to get the story first. We want to be there. But I think there's a little bit of camaraderie around that support and, and, and uh, the, this collaborative um, newsroom effort where uh, there might be a single topic that a number of newsrooms will cover. This has been a model in Philly. There's an organization called Resolve Philly. Um, and they've done a lot of collaborative journalism where there are a number of newsrooms who cover a certain topic and then it's all elevated. So I think that's an opportunity now that it's more of a, it can be a, a bit of a rallying cry instead of feeling like, well, we're doing that story and it just, it's out there and is, it, is anybody out there, is anybody listening? And there can be a, a ripple effect and kind of a slow clap that builds with, with working, kind of working with other newsrooms. So that's certainly a goal of ours. You know, I, I often said throughout the pandemic that, um, that it, one thing we really got out of it was the importance of journalism. Uh, there was a time, uh, you know, sort of after I stopped watching the data coming from the high school student on Mercer Island, um, who was for a while the main source of national data, uh, I was turning to the newspaper pages. Uh, for you know all the information because at that time we really had a, a silence coming from uh, from the highest levels of federal government as everybody remembers so I, I don't want to finish this conversation without having given a shout out to the role that journalism has played but both of you have mentioned that um, you know that race basically crosswalks with just about anything we can talk about mm -hmm. in um, the life of our country. Uh, and both of you, the work to bring that lens to stories. And if you could just talk a little bit about um, the importance of, of realizing that it's a card in the deck, so to speak, um, at the same time as the need to preserve a specific lens that the kind of work that you're doing. Do you think there'll be a time when we don't need to mm -hmm. add, you know, national reporter mm -hmm. focused on health disparities or have a, a whole newsroom that mm -hmm. devotes itself to these intersections and that it will become part of how we report the news? I don't see this happening in my <laughs> lifetime, but I now just want to hear it from you. I mean, I think yeah. that's the goal, right? Mm. Like, that's the goal is that it should not just be siloed to one person's beat or one person's area of coverage. It should be integrated through everything that reporters cover, you know, mm. um, because it is integrated in everything in not just this country, but I think globally. And part mm. of that is kind of understanding the way race functions and its dynamics mm. and how it's about power, right? And so if you're thinking about race and you're thinking about what it is and how it functions, and you're kind of taking a step back from, from these kind of interpersonal, you said something that is discriminatory or offensive, it, it gives a different way to begin to interrogate um, the way it, it plays a role in, in criminal justice, the way it plays a role in education, the way it plays a role in healthcare, because journalists, we interrogate power, right? Like that is ultimately a function of what we do as journalists. So if you think of race as a system of power, it would just make sense that it would be integrated through all of the coverage to be able to then interrogate it mm -hmm. and through that lens. Mm -hmm. And I would say um, at The Emancipator, our goal is to fill a void. Mm -hmm. And that void is um, having journalism with context and nuance and a through line. How did we get here? Um, what is redlining? <laughs> How did that really impact me? Why do I live in this neighborhood where you know I have to pay these prices and these tax prices? And you know why why are the homes over there cheaper than mine? Okay, like. People need that historical through line to understand how we got here. Why do two people living in two different zip codes that are almost butted up to each other have totally different, different life expectancy? It's not mm -hmm. random. And they didn't choose to go live over there, and they didn't choose to live this way. Um, so I think there's still a lot of explaining that needs to be done because of the American education system, that things that we are not ta taught. I think of so many things that I've learned as an adult, as a journalist, that I wish that I knew and I had an understanding of. And I hope that that is better now for you know young kids and 
coming up, there's maybe more access to the books, to the movies, to the podcasts, the documentaries that are explaining the history of racial inequality, but I think there's still explaining to do. There's still, you know, what are the other Tulsas that we just haven't heard about? So I feel like our role um, is also as an archive, as archivists, to unearth these archives, to explain them, to lay them out so that people really have an understanding of how did, how did we get here so that they can then move forward from that. Hmm. That, that's a really important idea, isn't it, that we're speaking not only to the public now, uh, but to the future. I mean, you're speaking to the yeah. future. Um, yeah. And I'm sure many of us who, who work in public health hope that we're speaking to the future as well. Um, I, I have a question that is, um, is difficult um, uh, because it's very broad, but let, let's give it a try. Um, the, uh, the, the fact is, uh, and there are polling data that show this, that uh, government, the media, the academy, uh, all are in declining standing uh, with the public. Um, and we have a credibility gap. Uh, so what do you think we can do um, to gain credibility? And what do you think the role of journalists is in this process? how we reach a broader audience, how we, of course, in media, because there's been such an explosion of potential, of what people view as, as sources of information, that it's increasingly difficult um, to, uh, for people to navigate uh, information that's coming to them that makes sense, that is credible, and that is not. So part of this question is about trust and the public trust. And part of the question is um, about how we help people become more discerning in navigating the uh, information landscape. Uh, so why don't we take the trust one first? <laughs> uh, and you can dispatch with it quickly and say, that's our problem, <laughs> <laughs> not yours. But, uh, and then let's talk a little bit about the kind of how changed the landscape is for how people gain information. Mm -hmm. I think um, part of the trust is, I, I, I think about trust as a journalist when I'm trying to build trust with someone and tell them and be transparent about, we're going to interview you for an hour. I'll probably take one quote. I want you to know what to expect, but please know that everything you're telling me is this uh, research and this knowledge that is helping me to make the story better. I think there's some some media literacy um, mm -hmm. that just needs to be espoused by us as journalists mm -hmm. so that people really understand how we do what we do. But then I think in the final product it is that top-notch sourcing and fact-checking and um, transparency about sourcing and who did we talk to and how many people did we talk to and where are they where do they live um, who is this who is the reporter we're, we're building a new website now and, and and our web designer said you know you may want to have a headshot of the writer because that's also just something that gives credibility that shows this is a real person that wrote this story and here's what they look like <laughs> and, you know little things like that or accessibility is a small mm -hmm. thing too. It's not a, but it's not a small thing. It's treated maybe as a small thing. Again, building the website, we're thinking about readability, accessibility. Um, we're thinking about our events. You know, um, we had an event. It took. Um, it was a public event, and we we had to get a ramp installed, and we we did all these a whole level of just making sure that anyone who came, because we knew there were some folks who needed it, knew that they were welcome here. So kind of finding these ways to show people this is for you. It's about that, that, uh, that way, uh, finding a way to have that audience engagement in an authentic way and have, you know, it's not a one-way conversation. It's not a one-way channel where you just turned on the evening news and you just sit there and, and you, just, you just take it in. <laughs> that now there's an exchange where right. we get ideas from people. People are, I'm sure, you've got, I don't get the emails. <laughs> you get probably emails, mm -hmm. DMs, because mm -hmm. you're writing these stories. Text oh. messages. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, Carrier pigeons, the whole thing. <laughs> Carrier pigeons. If, if you could talk about the whole issue of credibility of sources um, in the, the couple of minutes that we have left here. I mean, you know, Amber's actually absolutely correct. And I think part of it is also mm -hmm. we, you know, we have to talk about news deserts and, and, and the fact that there are fewer and fewer local news outlets, which I think ultimately harms reporters' credibility because there's less kind of familiarity with what a credible news source is nowadays because mm -hmm. people have so many options. It's, it's not, 
you know, the local newspaper. And I think there is something tangible about being able to pick something up and see it in print. Um, that really doesn't exist anymore. And so I think as reporters, it is also part of our job to help build that trust, to go to sit in the coffee shops that don't actually or quite often engage with reporters and just listen, mm -hmm. ask people questions, and then not just listen, but then write about the ideas that you get, right? So if you want people to engage with you, you have to say, I, I didn't just listen to what you said, look at the product of this, and then keep going back, right? You have to kind of keep going back, keep engaging, keep doing that give and take. It takes time. Mm. Which, you know, in this world, if it's not 180 characters or now it's 260 characters or like, you know, <laughs> a 90 second video, like people are, don't want to do it or engage in it. But you really have to just put the time in to listen, listen mm. for understanding, not listen to extract information, but listen to understand mm. and then give people a product like as in I'm producing stories, we're producing websites, give them a product that they want to return to because they see themselves and they see their communities mm -hmm. and they see their issues reflected accurately mm. in them. And of course that kind of listening can't be done by artificial intelligence. <laughs> and if you could just say a few words, and uh, I know you've been thinking about it, it this. It cannot so be done by, I, I have <laughs> thought a lot about this. Um, in part, it's because, you know, what we're just talking about, right? Mm -hmm. If you look at kind of the data sets for what's out there, and that would be scraping the news, the news ecosystem as it exists, there's still a lot of work to be done to repair the current news ecosystem. So if that is what is feeding the algorithm that is going to help um, allegedly possibly produce more n news and information, I mean, that I think should give us all a little bit of pause because what is going in is questionable at times often, and so then what is it putting out? Right. Right, the old expression, garbage in. <laughs> well, it's not garbage, but uh, when we have bias in our society, it will be reflected mm -hmm. and it will be collected. Absolutely. So, uh, I don't know if we have time for another question. Uh, or can somebody, well, we're going to turn to the um, in-house audience soon. Um, but I think that our, my time is up. Uh, for the online conversation. So let me just thank both of you, Amber, Akila, uh, for such thoughtful, unscripted, I want to be clear, <laughs> comments. And we're going to say goodbye to trust. our online audience now. Uh, thank you all for joining us. And if you missed any part of this program, you'll be able to view it on demand on the Harvard Chan's uh, YouTube channel. Uh, so have a wonderful rest of your day. Uh, where whatever time zone you're in, and thank you.